Hi, I'm Jay Cohen, creator, writer of Astounding Tales. Uh, you can find me on Instagram on underscore Jake underscore Cohen and also read issue zero at funnyfigs.com backslash astounding. And you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Raymond Griffith, artist of Astounding Tales. And uh, you can find us everywhere it matters as Funny Figs or funnyfigs.com slash astounding if you want to get a little taste of what the comic looks like. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by two very talented individuals. One of them has been on the show in the past, and we had a wonderful conversation about Astounding Tales Issue 1. And of course film history and a variety of other things as well too i'm not sure if i made it into the interview which means you'll have to watch the past interview of this amazing guest but we're joined by both the writer and the artist of the series today on two geeks talking by jake cohen and raymond griffith how are you both doing today hello i'm jake i am uh the uh writer of astounding tales but more importantly i am joined by my collaborator uh mr Ray griffith the guy who brings it to life Oh, I'm doing excellently. Thank you so much for taking the time. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm the writer, and uh, this all got started uh, way back in the uh, the before before time during the pandemic. I had a four page script that I was sending, uh, or I was sending a four page submissions to 2000 AD. They had like a aftershock submissions, like a short four pagers with a twist at the end and during the pandemic they stopped accepting submissions um and with uh some of the uh the fine money that the u.s government was giving us to stay home i uh used that to commission mr ray griffith and that's how this uh whole romance uh started and um now we're on to issue two and that is very uh very close to a completion and uh hopefully soon we could be kickstarting it and doing some other fun stuff to promoting it and uh kind of this is a our step on our path towards uh promotion to uh, getting letting people know aware that this comic book exists and i guess you know also thanks to ray for frankly his hard work i think you know, sometimes in different corners of the internet, people discuss kind of the division labor or who's more important or, you know, and this is not any false humility or anything like that, but Ray brings it to life. Like I always say, if I was left to my own devices, it would be like stick figures and dicks. Like that's what I could draw. Um, and so it's not any false humility, you know, and also I think, especially because cinema and like uh uh, visual storytelling is so popular and kind of the dominant kind of medium these days that people like to use film analogies and some people throw around the writer kind of being the director and I would not subscribe to that as all uh, at all I would in the way of a screenwriter I'm very much I'm the writer you know I make a blueprint but I wouldn't just call Ray the cinematographer just the person shooting I would call him the director too because he depicts the images and also in terms of my scripts, I um, write them very much like a screenplay. Like I'll put down panel breakdowns, but also those are not set in stone by any means, but I don't put camera angles. And that's the same thing in a movie script. That's left up to the director and the cinematographer. And I look at, you know, I give kind of what's happening in this scene. And then Ray depicts the screen at the scene. And that includes the camera angles. So definitely, you know, he'd be more so the director and the cinematographer in terms of the, the, division and labor i'm just a, a lowly writer in a cave i come up with a dopey idea but then he he brings it to life and and oftentimes elevates you know these do dopey ideas to say uh, i didn't know this is my directorial debut but uh i appreciate oh, no that. issue zero was um, this is your third <laughs> that's true i just didn't know i had the title <laughs> yeah. i mean that's why i think it's really uh, that, that could be a debate for another day but I think some people say in comic books, the writer is the director. I don't agree unless like you are the a writer artist. I, I but whatever, that's a, a, a debate for another day. I, I don't agree with that analogy. A debate to be had. <laughs> but uh, to get back to it, uh, my origin is a little strange. Um, I started out 
with art when I was 16. Um, I started as a caricature artist at a local theme park. And, uh, you know, I did that for almost my entire adult life, uh, eventually branching out to, you know, run my own company. Uh, but the comics thing always came about because that's always something that I really wanted to do and just never knew how to break into. And finally, I just, you know, it was like 2018 when I sat down and said, look, if you don't do it now, you're never actually going to do it. So you might as well just give it a shot. Um, I think we were on a, you know, like a Reddit, a subreddit uh, for uh, collaborating on comic books and I saw this pitch I was like hey that sounds kind of fun <laughs> sent him a message and uh, we've been working together ever since that's how I roped him in and I'm never letting go <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what we talked about briefly in our, fir in our first interview with Jake as well because it was the art that was just incredible and, and honestly I think I used the giant turtle as the title image as you know the background there just because it was just so awesome it's just like just from a perspective perspective, say that three times fast. Um, <laughs> it, it's just, it's just amazing to see like size and, and depth and everything like that from, from an, being an artist, obviously, and, and a caricaturist is that those are two completely different styles. Um, what was it about this script when you were working with Jake, where you said, this is what I want to do. And this is how I can not only improve myself as an artist, but improve this comic as well. Well, well first I want to say that, you know, you'd be surprised at how applicable some of that caricaturing can be, because when you're talking about perspective, you know, you're talking about things being bigger and smaller in relation to each other. And that's all character right there. You've got huge hands, huge heads, tiny little bodies. I was well-trained for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as to, uh, as to what attracted me to the script, like I said, it was just tight, action-packed. You know, it, it's, if you've read the comic, it very much speaks to that classic comic feel. You know, here is our characters. Here's our adventure. We're ready. We understand it. We're moving forward. You know, we, we waste no time in these comics. You know, in terms of like, uh, if someone, again, going to like a, like a film example, it kind of Raiders is kind of the, the touchstone in terms of like, it goes. Once the story happens, like it's very much nothing against modern comics. I'm a big believer that like every generation deserves their own stories. But in terms of like a, it's not decompressed story. We're not writing for the trades. You know, there's not going to be like pages of like talking heads. Like this is like a visual storytelling. Um, but also it's really neat. Uh, I, I feel at least like I, I loved, like you said, starting from issue zero, you know, I, I fell in love with Ray's art, but in terms of like now issue two, you do see the progress as well. Like he's, you know, he was, he was awesome to start, but you definitely, you, you see a progress. And like, for, for me, I think that's, and I hope readers as well think that that's, you know, you could definitely see, see the growth and it. it's kind of cool. And also I, I want to, I don't know if this has anything to do with, caricature artists but ray you can speak to this that i think in especially in terms of comic book artists ray can depict like children and teens and adults all well like his kids just don't look like tiny shrunken adults like there's the famous like john byrne instances where he draws babies and they're just like weird looking like adults with like misshapen heads and it's like super bizarre that like i think that's something that ray right off uh, oh, does like super well is that like different they're not just different size humans they're distinctively like oh that's recognizably a child that is an adult that is a teenager didn't know if you want to add anything right <laughs> yeah yeah i had one thing to say um so part of the process for creating issue two involved um some life changes for me so it took a little longer than we had hoped and so you can actually see the evolution of my art in the issue itself. You know, you go from page one, which was drawn two years ago, <laughs> and you go to the last page and you're like, wow, was this even drawn by the same guy? <laughs> um, I mean, there's consistency, but at the same time, you're like, this this is definitely a step up. <laughs> I think in the designs, though, of the, um, you know, we a lot of times we, uh, not in issue zero so much, but in one and two, we kind of have like a cold open. And the design work of like the character design in issue two, I think is is really awesome. I think we we introduced some really neat characters. Um, but in general, like his characters, like you said, the turtle. Um, I mean, obviously, I want to give him something to work with. I don't want to be like completely vague, but on the other hand, that like 
hey man, like giving the ball and to run with it. And I think you you see that in terms of the art that like he's enjoying what he he's putting down. And definitely with the character design, like, you know, I do have some ideas in my head, but you know, those are really um you know, largely right. In ter- especially in terms of, like the monsters and stuff like that. And I know he digs like drawing that kind of stuff. So I try to kind of put in stuff that he enjoys drawing. I do apologize once again, that there's some automobiles in there, but they're not highly referenced automobiles. I, I promise you, you could, uh, you know, but uh, so I apologize for that, but I try to put in, and I think for any aspiring uh, writers out there, I know you have that magnum opus in you, um, but try to, you know, talk to your artist and like, what do you dig? Like, what blows your hair back? Um, and then you get really cool fucking, oh, ooh, shit. Oh. You get really cool, like, like the giant turtle in Zero when you kind of embrace your artists and kind of give them room to kind of express themselves and t- tell their story within the story. As an artist, what is the most misunderstood aspect about the superhero genre in art that people who don't follow it misunderstand? That's a good one. That is a really really good question what is the most misunderstood hmm i'm gonna have to think about that um yeah yeah. i'm glad he asked you that one background brain busters that's i guess just the amount of time would be my immediate reaction to that like nobody understands how much work these are unless they've actually tried to do it um i'm reminded of the time I, i listened to a nerdy podcast called planet money where uh you know, they tried to make a comic book one time. They thought they were going to get it done in three months. And then a year later, it finally came out. And they're like, oh, this is really long and time consuming. I see now. <laughs> so then how, how do you speed up your process in terms of uh, as an artist as well, too? Because the reason why is um, I'm asking is I'm always curious from the, the technical standpoint, because you don't start off great. Obviously, there's trial and error. How have you improved yourself? Because you said life changes happened in this current issue that made you get better. Well, the life changes didn't make me get better, but it did Uh make the issue take longer. I think what made me get better was the fact that I had to take more time on each page due to those changes. Um, Basically, I had to get a real job is what happened. Um, I no longer am doing caricature. I do something very exciting called aircraft research, uh, aircraft title research, which is just thrilling. (laughs) Um, But, you know, because I was spending, instead of a couple days on a page, I was spending like a week or two looking at it. I would start to stop and pause and really think about what I was doing rather than just trying to get something on a page, Uh, taking more time with the backgrounds, using perspective lines, trying to create a real setting that that's that was what made the difference for me are you still a traditional artist or have you gone full-time into digital do you still dabble in the island completely digital i don't even touch ink anymore i just use procreate as soon as i got that tablet everything changed was it a large learning curve though Oh, not really. And that's what I like about it so much because, you know, I, I messed with tablets before, but primarily I was a traditional artist completely before then. Um, all the characters I did were marker on paper, um, you know, a little airbrushing. But I think that also helped get me ready for it because it helped me make confident lines and helped me, you know, know how to visualize what I'm putting on the page before I put it on there. Being able to visualize what you are trying to put on the page is what helps you create uh, that image. If you can, you know, have confident lines by practicing with something like a marker where you can't erase, uh, you're going to start thinking ahead going, okay, what do I actually want to do here? What does this need to look like? And when you can visualize that, it's much easier to put it on the paper or, you know, the digital paper as it is. As an artist though, what is the, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice and what's the most BS piece of advice but what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Hmm. I think if if I had to categorize them, I don't know if it's right up there at the second or the third, but probably one of the better pieces of advice I, I ever got was if it doesn't look right, add more contrast. And that can mean a lot of things. Um, you know, it can be contrast in line weight. It can be contrast in colors. It can be contrast in you know, sizes of objects in the screen. But anytime there's something that isn't clicking with the picture, with the image you're trying to create, add more contrast and it works. That's good. That's actually a good point. I like that. 
Because usually when you have a vision of something that goes on the page there, you're kind of, you, you don't always give yourself flexibility to, to change, usually. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Wow. Jeez, that's, that's another good one. I mean, I think communication in general that I've always been, since I was a kid, like enamored with visual storytelling. So I think sometimes, let's say like, you have a splash page with like no words at all. Like that they'll say the image communicates everything. And, um, and it's a situation where it's a writer collaborating with an artist, but they're like, where's the words, where's the writing and be like, Oh, that picture is the writing. You know what I mean? That, uh, as human beings, you know, we communicate in like a lot of different ways and this is a, a visual medium medium and a lot of the writing is me communicating to Ray that like, uh, frankly, that like sometimes like with the captions and even the dialogue to some extent that like I feel kind of, I don't know if guilty is the right word. And like, I need to put words in here because I feel bad. Like I need to do my part of the job. Um, but a lot of the writing is me, like, the, especially because a comic book script you know, it's just in this situation, it's just me talking to Ray. But at the most, it's like, a, a, you know, a colorist, a penciler, an inker. So like maybe f an editor, maybe five, six people, as opposed to a film script has or a play, like any type of script like that has to be a very specific uh, format because it's going to be sent to production designers, producers, all kinds of people. And they all need to kind of see the same thing in their head. Yeah. But me and Ray are having a conversation. So the writing is not necessarily always the dialogue it's me talking to ray and that the, the 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 images are kind of as powerful and that's kind of the dominant me or out you know what i was gonna say this is the present day dominant medium but i mean like cave drawings is a thing so i guess that the 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 the, the, the text and the, the image have always been kind of Yes, that's what separates us from the animal kingdom. That and underpants. Elephants hey, you guys can paint, man. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say, I have a pretty good example, actually. Oh. Something that immediately springs to mind when you're talking about communicating, uh, like, with image and writing. Think back to 2008 and the Barack Obama Hope poster. Oh. I'm still of the opinion that that played not insignificant role in getting that man elected. Oh, right. It was just what? such a powerful image, you know? What else then from your own creative perspective then? I think, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'll have to think about that. Uh, but I think what's interesting is also in the eyes, uh, whether you're doing prose or collaborating with an artist, you're talking about like power. And I don't want to get too Alan Moorish in terms of like magic and things like that. But the idea of like, you know, magic, you're using words to like create power and bring things to life that whether it's prose and you're like bringing an image to life in someone's imagination, or in this case, like using words where that words that then Ray brings like an image to life, you know, you know, I know your kind of your question kind of speaking more to like words that have been inspirational that have power and stuff like that, but just the idea of like words then translating into tangible things. And that's kind of like a weird alchemy and magic in and of it itself because that's what magic is right we're doing like an incantation and then alan morris pr prays to a snake god and that like brings things into the tangible world world but that kind of is comic books also like i create a, a like a series of phrases i put string together letters and syllables and through these letters and syllables and some you know maybe a comma a period every once in a while ray brings like a tangible thing into this like world and that's kind of fucking magic. It's sorcery. <laughs> it is a mysterious alchemy, especially, you know, I guess in this situation where I have a great love for artists. I love art. You know, I study art academically, but like, you know, I guess people consider it like writing an art, but I mean art in terms of like a craft, like bringing something tangible. It is kind of an alchemy because like, and then he's doing it on the, on the computer, which I even have less of a grasp of that there is like a certain amount of like, oh, oh, it's almost like, and I mean, maybe people know how their car works, but I don't. That like you bring your car to the mechanic, like I turn my key and like, oh my God, the internal combustion engine. This is like magic. This is alchemy to me. And much in the same way, what Ray does is like, oh, wow. 
I, you know, I could draw the head of a Ninja Turtle because that's like a cert, an oval and then like a rectangle for the bandana and then like a half circle on top. So it's also something I could draw just the head of a Ninja Turtle. But like when he's putting all these panels, like you're saying, like perspective and like uh, uh, rubble and like uh, all these like cityscapes and all it's alchemy. It's it's magic, you know, nothing I could say would be more beautiful than that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And that's why he's the writer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I try to. I got that. Try to bring my uh, Stanley kind of pitchman huckster carnival barker, because uh, I guess also in terms of the the um, the the the, the, the uh, division of labor, and you know, obviously, I have a soft spot, or I have a very soft spot for Stan in my heart. But obviously, nowadays, it's becoming a bit more controversial because kind of the truth of the division of labor and kind of where the credit went. But in terms of like that division of labor, you know, obviously I'm, I'm giving Ray more than a plot. I'm not like a Stanley, like, ah, oh, I think we'll have a Galactus today. And then like Ray makes a three thing trilogy. And like we all did this together, <laughs> but regardless of that bringing, cause there is a great division of labor that, you know, at the very least, like when we go on something like this, I could kind of pick up the slack and be like the carnival barker of this whole kind of, uh, this whole operation. Excelsior, true believers. <laughs> well, I mean, even like, I'd say like the line editing, um, even with like dialogue where it's something that the grammar doesn't have to be perfect because it's people speaking. Mm -hmm. Like um, people definitely, and I appreciate like the people that we have that like read it before we send it out. My whole point is that that's after me checking myself, the amount of like edits that get caught yeah. Like, it's not like I'm sending this out blindly. This is drafts later. Like, so editing is all our, our friends, definitely. Or, I mean, I get, or Ray can also speak to this, I guess, um, in terms of like him doing the art himself. That I guess if there was a division of labor of like a penciler and inker, that like he, that things can be caught and that he's kind of editing himself. Yeah. Um, that, the, you know, he is both penciler, inker, colorist. Whereas like a normal comic book process, like a Marvel comic where you have like three or four people, someone could be like, oh, there's two thumbs pointed <laughs> in the same direction. Humans don't have hands like that. Like Ray is catching <laughs> it all on his own. It's happened. I had to redo a couple uh, panels because I was just like, what were you on when you drew this? <laughs> this is just not right. <laughs> I was listening to some comic book YouTubes and they brought up a good point. Some like the more famous like Rob Liefeld kind mm -hmm. of like flubs or like famously like bad kind of art mm -hmm. that he does ink himself a lot in his current art but some of these images had a different inker and is did, was the inker like oh like screw Rob Liefeld like I'm not I'm not correcting this like it's just got it's coming it's going down on the paper as he, he penciled it I will give you a counterpoint Sure. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, um, you know, you wouldn't be talking about it now if you hadn't drawn it that way. So maybe there's something to be said for, you know, quote unquote inaccuracies. Oh, I, I think, yeah, some of the famous like, like comic errors was there like a thing of a marketing thing like that. But also in today's day and age where it's popular and there are like, like the Captain America image that's famous. that's like very squirrely, but just to defend Rob Liefeld, because I was like the right age when he was like doing New Mutants and X Force, that like that art did speak to kids. I wasn't a huge actually image kid because also the better paper stock mm. was weird to me. I'm like, well, what is why is the paper like glossy? So like the bad the better paper and better inking actually was one of the things that turned me off to image. But I am totally the right age. Jim Lee's X Men. Um, Rob Liefeld on, you know, Will Portas Portasio on Uncanny, like I was eight, not seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And like, yeah, people have, and some, a lot of it's legitimate criticism, but it did connect with people. And like, I think people are missing that context of like, you know, it's like um, when I see a Star Wars movie now, I love Star Wars since I was six years old. It yeah. blew my mind. Well, when I first learned there were multiple Star Wars, that was like one of the most exciting things I saw was at the library and like looked in the like, oh my God, there's more than one of these movies. So like when I they saw made another one, <laughs> and now it's when serious. I went to Rogue, see Rogue One in the theater, I, I went with my brother-in-law and my little nephew and I enjoy Rogue One very much. But one of the first things my, my brother-in-law told me, like, hey, Jake, do you, did you like it? What do you think about it? At first I looked down at my little nephew. Did you like it? 
Like every generation deserves their own stories. And I think whatever you have to say about Rob Liefeld, good, bad, or indifferent, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of negative things you can say. Uh, but that that art really connected with people at the time. Um, and also, I guess now as an adult, what I didn't realize, because one of the things I love most about that era of X-Men is the... Um, now, the character design was cool, but the art design, like how they drew tech and vehicles. And I guess this is before the internet and before Mango, Mongo was around, but not super and uh, pervasive. And a lot of the anime was anime that was like repurposed, like stuff like uh, Voltron, yeah. you know, that anime wasn't as ubiquitous. That that's all Appleseed. It's, uh, it's like a mixture of Terminator 2, like James Cameron art design, like Aliens, Terminator 2, and Appleseed. I did not know all that, uh, like the way they drew tech that I loved in like those X titles. That is 100% now as an adult. That's Appleseed right there. Yeah, so yeah. anyone who loves those comics, the way Wills drew tech as well, I love how they drew tech. But it's 100% they're cribbing off Appleseed. Oh, yeah. yeah, but then, now looking back, you're like, oh, because at, at that age, being like seven-year-old, Growing up in like suburbia, like that was totally mind blowing. But I'm like now as an adult, like oh, they got into some, you know, or even like I think it's even more impressive looking back the Frank Miller Daredevil, or even later on Ronin, yeah. that he was totally cribbing manga influences. That like how was he getting a hold of that stuff? And like I think early '80s or even late '70s, like he was getting his hold of like Lone Wolf and Cub, like non translate, and like kind of getting stuff from that and i don't think there's anything wrong with that i mean we're all doing that and like i think what's interesting sometimes is looking back on what ray and i create is there's definitely intentional homages like things that influences i want to get down um we have one script where i told in the script in the script like no spoilers but i'm like this is like the old boy hall hallway scene mm -hmm. i said i'm like a you youtube clip from like the film old boy but there's other things that we get back that like, I'm like, oh, this was like in the deep recesses of my lizard brain. And like, I didn't realize that was a thing. And like, oh, this is totally a thing. Like I see it. Um, like one of the things I noticed is um, there's like an old cartoon from the uh, the eighties was, is it Bionic six or Bionic seven? So like a family of Bionic, it's like a Fantastic Four-esque kind of homage. And they're like a family of, you know, they get bion Bionic powers. And I think I sent Bray like the bad 80s intro. And I'm like, this is definitely totally a thing that is somewhere in my <laughs> lizard brain that is like leaking onto the onto the page, yeah. you know. Astounding Tales 2, are you doing a Kickstarter campaign or is this just going to be through your website? Like, how, what's that game plan? Yeah, absolutely going to be a Kickstarter campaign. In fact, it was supposed to be a Kickstarter campaign right now. It's a little bit delayed. Entirely my fault. But we oh, going to no, get there. Dude, I mean, the I wouldn't. reason it is... I, Please. It happens when it happens, dude. You got to keep your human alive. Well, I just, I, I hate not being able to deliver. Um, when we did our first Kickstarter, the book wasn't done. I had to finish the pages and like that three months was just a nightmare for me. So I swore I'm not going to do another one until the book's 99% of the way there. So we're, we're getting there. Uh, we've got, you know, everything's inked, everything's or uh, most things are flatted, uh, half the book's colored. So it's a couple more, weeks away but we'll get there and then we will be launching or uh what was the um in the beginning of issue one when i was like oh it's an old-fashioned uh scooter thing what was it That's and you like drew it analog but oh. overboard so like i'm like in the yeah and i was like oh it's like an old school like uh hoverboard like uh the like the kids roll around on these days and he thought i meant like an analog hoverboard like a marty mcfly hoverboard but with like fans <laughs> and he was gracious enough to be like oh uh, now i understand what you're talking about when we spoke but that was definitely like a miscommunication and like old school hoverboard halloween maybe oh okay yeah we're 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 trying for as early a fall as we can get but you so, know also you know obviously uh, this is to promote issue two and that kickstarter but also you know if people are interested in issue zero and one they're still floating out there zero can be read you know i don't want to plug early or whatever but on ray's website you get issue zero there's so there's op area places people can view uh zero and one as well it's an ongoing but they're also self-contained ish you know so like you don't need you could read totally any of them as its own deal this is not as uh dense as like a claremont x-men which is definitely like 
has a soft spot in my heart. But I do think there is something missing in modern comics. There aren't all missing, but like that you can look things up on the internet that like back in the day where you're like, oh, like this is a copy of like Batman 400 or like better yet, you know, 15 years into Claremont's X-Men run. And you are kind of like scratching your head and putting things together with headcanon and being like, if I only get a few more issues of this, I will understand what's fully happening here. And I think that's part of the joy of like um, comics is that kind of like filling in the blanks of like, this has been going on for a while. And like, what is, who are these people? What is happening? And like, I don't know, that's part of the excitement of it. And I think maybe the internet kind of ruined a little bit of that, that, uh, you know, canon is not so clear. Like canon should be used to benefit you. It shouldn't be like a dogma. These aren't things like from high up top the mount, you know, we're not talking about like the Torah or something like that. <laughs> you know, this is not the, uh, the new Testament. So I think a little bit of that head canon, like for me, when I was a kid, um, uh, it, when uh, the, the words uttering, like, I fought with your father in the Clone Wars and mm-hmm. Star Wars, like, what are the Clone Wars? Like, wh- to me, it's almost more exciting when there was no Clone War cartoon. And I had to just think of, like, what a Clone Wars was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and in my head, at six years old, I thought, I imagined... Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and before you knew spoiler alert Darth Vader is Luke's father that like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker were fighting literal armies of clones that was my headcanon that someone created evil clones of the Jedi Mm -hmm. and that was the Clone Wars Um, or also like when you talk about with friends like I heard that Darth Vader like fell into a volcano and this is what many years before the prequels were even a thing you know let's say like the late 80s early 90s of like just being like filling in the blanks yourself. And I think that's some of the brilliant writing in Star Wars is the implied things that make perfect sense, but also you imply, a lot, there's a lot for you to kind of um, imply on your own. And also that makes a much bigger universe. Yeah. Um, when everyone knows each other and everyone's like bumping into each other and you know every bit of a backstory, it makes it a very tiny universe but when you say things like your father and i fought in the clone wars and it's just that line by itself and then you're moving on to the the actual meat and potatoes of the narrative that makes a universe immense that makes a universe big and i think sometimes in our modern storytelling with prequels and explaining every little thing where i think storytellers are forgetting that and they're making their universes very small like finding out that han solo's name is because his name is a uh, serial loner. Your name is Solo. And also in the same movie, we find out where he gets the Millennium Falcon, uh, why he has a crush on like uh, short, uh, petite br- uh, brunettes. Mm-hmm. And like every aspect of his life, he meets Chewbacca, which that part did make me tear up. Like they're going to be best friends forever. Um, but finding all those things in one story, in one 90 minutes, makes your universe super tiny. Yeah. Um, and by the way, how you really as feel someone about that movie. <laughs> who lo- who loves the expanded universe and still reads those EU books and has since, you know, when they were coming out, Han Solo, Solo is a family name from Karelia. All right. We all know this. I don't know none of this. Like, oh, you're Solo. So this is like, I think they stole that from like Lord of the Rings where they're like, if you're a bastard, like you, ha- you have these like regional like names. No, <laughs> he has a family. Solo is a family name. That's be that's a for another day. Yeah, uh, we could do an, an entire episode of just on Star Wars alone. We'll have. To I got that. opinions. I know. I know. However, Trust though, me. do you? I, I wasn't I, sure. However, though, every generation should have their own stories. So if there's some kid out there who's ten and loves Solo and it's their religion, more power to you. God bless. Like enjoy your stories. Don't listen to me. I'm an old fart. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Well, I guess uh, if it's going to be one person, I think oftentimes like uh, I'll cite kind of people that I I don't know personally. And I I think there's a litany of those people who who really uh, uh, ignited my imagination. But I think uh, too often, you know, like I said, citing people that aren't kind of personal people in my life. So I'm going to say my older sister, Gigi, and uh, for, for a few reasons. Um, one is, uh, she's, uh, well, now she's kind of retired, but she's a photojournalist that like someone could, uh, make a living kind of doing art and creating things and stuff like that. She's 14 years older than me. 
So kind of the value of art, the value of being an artist, um, you know, most people in my family are kind of either like academics or professionals or things like that. She's one of the few people that is like involved in the, in the arts. Um, not, not the only person. I have some other family members that are involved in the arts, but kind of close, you know, generationally to me. But the other thing of her being 14 years older than me, and this also ties into my parents maybe being a little lax in their duties of monitoring what I consumed, whether I was with my sister or not. But because I hung out with someone 14 years older than me, like literally when she was in college and we would visit her, my parents would stay in a hotel and I would stay in her dorm with her friends. Or when she graduated college, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to be you know, 8, 10, 12 years old and hanging out in Manhattan or staying over in Manhattan or Brooklyn with her and her friends. So I was around a lot of like older people in terms of the art I, I consumed, whether it's films, movies, her taking me to comic book stores. Um, one of the first comics I ever bought on my own, I'm not at my house, or I'd show that that issue of Uncanny. She took me to the, this is when you could buy comics off the newsstand. And uh, she also took me, uh, she used to live um, down the street from um, St. Mark's Comics. She lived in the village on St. Mark's and 8th, or uh, on 8th and 2nd Avenue, which is down the street from St. Mark's Comics, was a famous um uh, New York City comic book store, chat now is in Brooklyn, um, I guess, but, but but it's still awesome. It's still called St. Mark's. So if people are visiting New York City, I highly encourage you to do go to St. Mark's Comics um, and used to t take me there to buy um, comic books and also uh, uh, Mar Marvel and X-Men trading cards because I'm of the right age when those were really popular. Um, so yeah, my sister for exposing me. And then also that has to do with also my academic career in, in film theory, because even as a kid, like seeing independent films, seeing silent films, seeing films that weren't necessarily meant for children. You know, she's the one who took me to see Terminator 2 when it, I was six and maybe I think Jurassic Park when I was like eight or 10. <laughs> and, um, but then also, you know, uh, in terms of like, I, I definitely recognize my my diet of films was different than all my friends for two reasons when I was little. One is when I was super little that all like the independent films that were like nominated for best picture, like, oh, I saw these all in theaters. You know, I saw, so you saw a train spotting. I saw this. I saw that when I when I was a kid, you know. And the other thing is uh, when I was maybe 12, 13, you know, the age you're having sleepovers with friends. This is when Blockbuster still existed. Uh, my friends are like, oh, rent some movies and went on your way over and try to think of all the films I got, but one of them I'm still, despite uh, controversy, I'm still a huge Woody Allen fan. Um, and uh, everything you ever want to know about sex, but are afraid to ask, which is hysterical. If no one's ever seen it, it is a very, very funny film, but I brought this to my friends among with us, some other films. I don't remember the other ones, but uh, I guess, similar kind of indie films, different films, like you know, that 12 year olds wouldn't normally be watching. And they're like, what is this? Why? And we even tried to watch it. And they're like, they turned it off. They're like, this is what are you doing? Like you're not renting films again. Like, <laughs> um, but also later on in our mid twenties, I'm still friends with all my childhood friends. One of my buddies, we were at a barbecue was talking about how funny that film is. Everything you ever want to know about sex, but we're afraid to ask. And I called him out on, I'm like, you know, you were at that sleepover when we were like 12 or 13 and did not like that movie. And he's like, yeah, because we were 12. I'm like, no shit. Um, but if anyone is, that is a very funny movie. Um, there's bestiality. There's a giant boob, uh, like, a, you know, like a giant, like, you know, atomic monster sized breast. Uh, it was, it's a great film. There, there's sperm that like fly out of like a, like a, like they're uh, like a parachutist or whatever. It's it's a good time, so I, I highly recommend it. But yeah, I guess my, my sister for just exposing me to art and music and and encouraging. She's not a comic book person herself. Um, encouraging and buying me comics and stuff like that. Well, um, you know, I'm gonna do similar where I could give you a list of artists who I admire and am inspired by. You know, Jeff Smith, Dave Gibbons, Frank Rosetta, so on and so forth. But really. The answer is the man who took a chance on me when I was 16 as a young artist and hired me on to do caricatures with no experience, uh, Scott Van Eck. And he's an incredible airbrush artist, an incredible caricaturist. Uh, he does a little bit of comics, but he doesn't really understand how the internet works, so you're never going to see any of them. Uh, but he's just truly an inspiration, truly a wonderful talent, and he's the only man I know who can insult you to your face and everyone will laugh. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. Everyone's laughing and he's like, oh, you're the ugliest guy I've ever seen. <laughs> it's amazing. 
I think also in terms of male camaraderie, and I, I tried to explain this to my nephew a few years ago. Like, if you're really close friends, I spent, and this was with, I think, guy friends, yeah. like you could tell by how close a group of like male friends are by how awful the things they are <laughs> saying are to each other. The more awful, the more you're like, oh, <laughs> these people are very close friends, you know? Oh, or, uh, no, but he's doing this to strangers. That's oh, the thing. You have to understand the better. people who sit down and are our customers and are paying us money, and he'll sit there and insult them to their faces, and they will love it. <laughs> From a professional standpoint, you are both very successful as a writer and an artist, and you have been doing this for a number of years together. And I can't wait to see issue two of Astounding Tales, and I can't wait to see the other issues as well whenever those come up. So professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourselves personally successful Ooh, that is a, a heck of a question it i really fire like the to tough think... ones at you man yeah <laughs> the fastballs. You're, you're asking me to evaluate both uh my ego and uh, <laughs> what i've done in the past um it's hard to call myself a complete success because obviously i'm not working full-time doing what i love anymore um but, you know, I recognize a lot of people are in that situation. It's not unique to me. So I think I'm successful in the sense that I do get to do what I enjoy and I am able to put it out there for people to see. So, yeah, in that respect, yes. Well, I do also have a little bit of a background in athletics. I'm a bit of a Long Island stereotype in that I grew up playing lacrosse and, and uh, played it in high school, college, and then coached high school and college lacrosse. I'm uh, also, I, I love Billy Joel. I'm all the, uh, the Long Island stereotypes, you know, I, until I grew up, I didn't realize people didn't learn Billy Joel songs in elementary school. If you d didn't grow up in Long Island, <laughs> um, in like music class, <laughs> um, but in turn, um, in terms of success, like I said, going back to athletics, I borrowed the John Wooden definition of success that did you do the best you can with the ability you're given you know that like if you're a football team and you're like a high school football team and you go play like the dallas cowboys or new york giants like your measure of success probably shouldn't be the scoreboard because you're in high school and they're nfl players like you have no chance of winning like what's going to be your can you play the best that you can play could you did you do everything to live up to your potential um so in terms of like the individual scripts i think the individual comics are, I would say, a, a, a success. So, in terms of like my co collaboration with Ray, I don't, I don't know I, either of us. You know, we would like to be more "quote unquote" financially successful, but in terms of like the, the product itself, the actual like art object, I think they are successful. Um, I would say though, in terms of um, as I'm getting older, you know, I'm a Forty, I'm uh, forty years. I'm the same age as Return of the Jedi, so I'm, um, you know, I'm getting up there. That like, if I spontaneously combusted like today, or I got like ran over by a bus, in terms of like the volume of work I've created, I don't know if I would consider myself a success in terms of that. I would like to have a greater kind of a um, canon of work, both academic nonfiction work and kind of fiction work at this age, I would like to have a, a greater, I think in that sense, you know, again, to be frank and kind of very self-aware, I don't think in that sense that, you know, uh, uh, to kind of on the other side of the coin, sometimes you hear about artists that like something happens to them and it's tragic. And then they go look in terms of their house and see all these like unfinished works. Uh, I think that, uh, I wish I could remember the documentary. There was one recently about a photographer that was a like, a, she worked in childcare and to, she nanny to the kitchen nanny to end up being filmmakers. And like later on, they found all her photos and they had people in the art world evaluate the photos and that she's like a world-class photographer that like no one ever heard of to like, you know, they unearthed all her stuff when she died that like, if that happened to me, I'm not saying the work is bad. I, like I said, the, I think the work Ray and I have created is definitely a success, but in terms of like volume of work that they're not going to find like trunks of materials of like, there's like, there's all these novels here. Uh, like, um, so in terms of like, uh, not necessarily breath, but just kind of volume of work, actual amount. Um, I, 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 you know, uh, no one lasts, no one gets off this ride alive. No one lasts. So I think uh, I would have liked, I think I should be, I should create more amounts of work, whether, you know, uh, especially, you know, in terms of like prose, things that like I, I don't depend on someone to collaborate with. And that also goes for, 
you know, non academic or rather academic work and nonfiction work. There is like a, a journal article about a uh, Rambo three and foreign policy and like history that I've been working on since like the beginning of the summer that like I need to complete and like submit to journals. Um, so hopefully people will let me into a PhD program. Um, please let me into a PhD program. Uh, if you're listening anywhere out there, I applied, no one let me in. Um, uh, so yeah, so I'd say in some ways, I think very much a success and other ways, uh, you know, I think, you know, like Ray's saying, you know, you gotta be a, a little he, he humble in these things. And, you know, I want to be answer your question kind of honestly and kind of be kind of self-aware about, about these things, you know, the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? In terms of failure, well, two things, going back to John Wooden, The Wizard of Westwood. So I know this is a, a comic book theme thing, but I guess also nowadays, I don't want to be too stereotypical. I don't think it was like when I was a kid and like I had to explain to my football team like what the X-Men were um, because like the movies were coming out. So I think there's a lot of people who play sports who are into sci-fi and comics and fantasy and you know vice versa but for those of you who are not this is another wooden quote and he's a legendary college basketball coach for ucla that uh don't be afraid of failure uh, or don't be afraid of mistakes a doer makes mistakes so in terms of like failure that means like you're trying stuff um so like not all of it's going to be successful and also frankly like if all your stuff like if that never fails, like you're probably not trying new things. You're probably not taking risks. So to go to like, um, like a comic book example and it, someone who was a big part of my youth, who's still, who's extremely successful, but kind of financially, like someone like Jim Lee, I don't think like he doesn't take a lot of chances. Like I think stylistically, I think his art's cool. Uh, but like, I don't know if he's grown a tremendous amount. I mean, Ray could speak to that better because, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an artist, but like, to me, it doesn't seem like it's definitely, it hasn't evolved that much. It's still kind of very, a similar style. And like, I don't, and I think this speaks to him as being a smart businessman, Jim Lee, but like, and like knows what's marketable. I think he's a brilliant businessman in that regard. Um, but I don't think his art, takes a lot of chances on the other side of the coin if you look at like bill sinkevich on his moon knight run where he's kind of doing like a neil adams thing and then he did like his new mutants thing and like the part of it chris claremont being on board and like empowering him and going i think it was jim shooter at the time was the editor being like this is what new mutants is going to look like um like that's a chance <laughs> like that's someone taking a chance <laughs> um so yeah, like that, you, you kind of, when you take a chance, you know, like there was a time in basketball where people didn't take a jump shot. <laughs> that was kind of a very uh, lateral, it wasn't a vertical game. And that like, if you took a jump shot, someone would like take your knees out or the forward pass in football. Like these were a time, like someone's like, you throw the ball fucking forward. Like what are you nuts? Like um, that there's, there's times, you know, where you're going to totally, or modern basketball where everyone's shooting threes. There was a time when that was uh, strategically like a very weird thing. So, um, you know, taking a chance or like uh, high concept films, like something like Jaws or Star Wars. There was a time when that wasn't a thing. And then the, the theater going to the late seventies into the very much into the eighties, nineties, high concept films became a thing, but there was a time when that like, wasn't a thing or, you know, see, sinking $200 million into a comic book film. There was a time when that wasn't a thing, you know? Um, so yeah, like uh, you, when you're kind of do it, uh, that's kind of when the, you push the ball forward is kind of when you're taking chances. So you may fall on your face. You know, if you make a movie about space wizards and giant, like, space dogs that like can fly the plane like there's a chance that 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 you fall fall on your face but that's when the cool shit happens too um so don't be afraid to to and i guess that plays into like humility and ego and stuff that like don't let your decisions be ruled by ego because that's when you're going to be kind of afraid to um kind of make mistakes and kind of fuck up well, I was going to say, first things first, um, I try to make it a point not to critique anyone's art unless they ask me to. So I've got nothing to say about Jim Lee. Oh. But <laughs> he hasn't sent me a memo yet. Um, <laughs> how do you deal with failure? 
other than with crippling amounts of Dr. <laughs> Pepper and snacks and food. Self-flagellation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I find it hard not to move forward even when I do fail just because this particular thing that I do, I enjoy so much. Um, I mean, it, it enjoys not even the right word. I feel compelled to do it. So even if something doesn't work out or if I don't, you know, see the returns on something that I'd hoped I'd see, you know, I'm still going to do it. Even if I was doing this in a black hole with no one who would ever see it, I, it, this is still what I would do. So I guess it's just pure momentum at this point. <laughs> The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired with creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you and the fact that you're inspiring them in some way, shape or form, maybe they're going to become creative in some way, shape or form in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? That is an incredible question. Um, you know, I am always humbled when someone younger comes up to me or their parents come up to me and tell them that they love drawing and they see what I do and they feel greatly inspired by it. And I would say that the way they can inspire others as they go on is to just do that same thing. Just show people what you're doing, even if you don't feel it's perfect, even if you don't, you know, think that it's something someone will enjoy there is someone out there who is going to like it so you should you know not be afraid to put it out there and yeah you will get some criticism but you have to be able to shrug it off and move forward and you know just don't be afraid well i think also especially regarding artists um because it really pains me when sometimes i hear those with parents like oh you can never support yourself as an artist you never get a job as an artist and i mean maybe that isn't true that could be true in terms of like fine arts it could be tough to find you know make a living and be like i'm going to be an oil painter but in terms of like literally being an artist as your vocation um that like everything is designed by somebody like literally everything in our world every product whether it's like your coffee maker you know your phone your car like everything in this in this house I, aside from the jack kirby collage I, you know i'm sitting in a house right now every product in this house is designed by somebody so in terms of like if someone wants art as their vocation that that is certainly a very realistic thing now like if it's like oh i want to make my living specifically being like a, a comic book artist you may have varying degrees of success and you know, it's like the same thing if I want to be like a rock musician or whatever but like if you're like literally I want to you know especially when someone's talking to children like that being like oh you can never find a job in the arts um now depending what your job is and like how what type of expression you have to do and stuff like that that varies but if you just in a very literal sense I want my to be paid to do art as a vocation that is a very realistic thing and not something you should discourage a kid from now i say that as not having a kid uh but uh i i just i feel really bad when i hear but i've you know been in several situations where i hear adults telling that to children and i think it's terrible to um you know kind of to dissuade a child from being in, involved in the arts or you know loving the arts uh, in any way um you know i think it's a shame in our in our society and our culture that in terms of the cost of education that we really social engineer uh people to going into uh, f uh avenues of education that just translate into dollars and cents that education is a wonderful thing intellectual curiosity is a wonderful thing and the arts are a wonderful thing and we should never dissuade a kid from being to having a, an interest in any of those things. Very inspirational. I love that. The answers from both of you. That works out very well. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Ah, so I think this is interesting because I think about this a lot, like the soundtrack I'm listening to that music definitely I'm a very visual thinker, so even music makes me think about images. Um, I guess right now I, I got a lust for life, like Iggy Pop says. Um, but probably like a, a Fisher Grateful Dead uh, show would be the soundtrack because uh, that's why I'm in Saratoga right now is for uh, Fish. Uh, added two shows last minute for um, 
Vermont flood relief. So I am also I'm taking part in a fundraiser and I got my, my Grateful Dead uh, shirt on just coincidentally. Um, and then comic uh, Dark Knight Returns, because because even though I'm an old man, I'm still at it. And I guess in the scenario is Ray, my Kerry Kelly. I don't know. <laughs> Where she's like, it's not time to die yet, old man. We still got more work to do. <laughs> so what, what would what would the title of your comic be then for your life? So if there was a comic about my life, it wouldn't actually be about me. It would be about my daughter because she's the star of everything. Um, and it would be called My Child is a Maniac and I Love Her. <laughs> and the entire soundtrack would be heavy metal. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, I do hate to say it, Jake and Ray, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Thank you for your time. Please. Before yeah, I let an absolute you pleasure. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Before I let you both go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is the Sounding Tales and anything else you both would like to promote? Well, I guess the biggest thing is if you haven't seen any of our work, check out Ray's website. And then also, so that's funnyfigs.com and then funnyfigs.com backslash astounding. You can see issue zero for free. Um, astounding comics is on the social and uh, I'm uh, underscore Jake underscore Cohen on Instagram and the link tree on there will take you to Ray's stuff to astounding tales stuff. And I think that's kind of the easiest, uh, easiest way to find us. Yeah. Um, so like he said, I am funny figs on all the things that matter on the internet. Um, I'm a little less on Twitter these days, but blue sky, uh, Instagram, Facebook, all of those. Yes. X, sorry. <laughs> um, and while, um, there is a preview of the comic available on my website, I will also just say for the record, you know, you can also go check it out on global comics. We have it uploaded there as well. If you want to get a little taste of what we're doing. Good stuff. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of two geeks talk. You can get, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com. That's T W O not the number two different website. You don't want to go to. But because that website's going through a revamp for the past 10 years or so, uh, you can find it on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.